Okay, let's start the show. For Thursday, January 2nd, 2020. Welcome to This Is Only a Test, the official podcast of Tested.com. Hello, everyone, and happy new year. Happy new decade. That's right. We are in the 20s, the most talked about decade of the last century, one of the most talked about decades. Is it the roaring 20s again? Oh, wow. well, we don't know yet. We don't know if this this decade will be the roaring 20s. A century ago, surely, it was the roaring 20s. Maybe it could be the boring 20s. Who knows? But we're starting off very exciting, although not a lot of news, so maybe boring. But Happy New Year. We decided to come into the office just to record this podcast. Everyone is actually still out, but you heard them already. Jeremy Williams is here. Happy New Year, Norm- Norman Chan. Happy New Year, Jeremy Williams and Kishore Hari. Happy New Year, all. Happy New Year. How, how did you guys celebrate your New Year's? You ready for boring 20s? Yeah. I went to bed early. You missed it? Yeah, I went to bed around like 9.45. That's because you don't have an Apple Watch. An Apple Watch sets off fireworks on the screen at midnight on New Year's Day. No. Yes. That it didn't happen terrible. to me. Did. I did not see that. Oh, maybe it's a it's a four and below feature. Maybe they don't have it on the new one that has no. the screen on all the time. I was looking at my watch waiting for the 59 to change over and nothing happened. Maybe. Hmm. Really? Yeah. That's surprising. Maybe it, was, it wasn't unlocked. Yeah, so it's worth staying up for that. Oh, wow. <laughs> you got to wait a whole another year now and get an Apple Watch, I guess, my, to do that. My kids were excited to stay up. That's why I stayed up. Uh, so we stayed up. And, you know, if you live in a big city, sometimes you get the hooligans setting off the illegal fireworks. Yeah. And so we, we watched those from our window. And if you have pets, that's one of the worst nights of yeah, the Yeah, apparently they hate it. They, were, they really hate it. How do you consult them? Uh, you just got to hold them tight and pr- promise that everyone's gonna, everything's going to be okay. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, hold hold their ears, uh, but that that is uh yeah it's it was kind of uneventful. I was I was watching Amazon Prime, was binging a show. I, I and, was and, catching up on TV too, <laughs> but we did get the New Year's earthquake. We yesterday. did, yes. So j- yesterday, January first, at uh, also around like ten p.m. or something in the Bay Area, we had a four point zero earthquake. I felt it. Yeah, apparently you and Danica both felt it. I did not. My wife did not. Our 12-year-old got out of bed, said, did you guys feel that? Was that an earthquake? We said, no, you're imagining things. Go back to bed, son. And <laughs> Maybe his bed's on, is it on casters or something where they're rolling? It's like he feels, you know, the earthquake resonates a little more. I think he's just in tune with life more than oh, I am. Oh, the force. Yeah, and so Surely. we felt horrible. Went in, woke him up, said he was right. <laughs> <laughs> hey. What's going on? Hey. Just hey, want to let you know. Wake up. Wake up. You were right. You were right. Wow, if only the internet acted like that. No, the internet would say you're, you're wrong. Leave it at that. Um, well, happy new year to all of you out there. Hope you all had a good new year. We actually have not recorded since the Christmas uh, holiday, um, if you celebrate that. So also, I'm going to go back a week and say, how were your Christmases as well? I know last week when we did a Skype check-in, we couldn't talk exactly about uh, the gifts that were given, the gifts right. that were received. Any, any gifts that you gave that you're particularly proud of that you can now reveal? No. Um, no. Like my short-term memory has like has degraded to the point where I can't even remember the stuff I uh, I gave. Like our uh, my mom got my son a PS4, so we've been playing quite a bit. Uh, he and he's already better at Madden than I am. I don't know how that happened so quickly. My son uh, got me this Mandalorian shirt. Wow. Okay. Which is you know, we have a thing about the show. We've been enjoying that together. My daughter gave me this uh, cover for my MacBook. Those are two of my favorite gifts that I received. The, That's the, not bad. It's, it's not for people not watching the video. The cover that covers the top of your MacBook Pro, yeah, is uh, has drawn markers upon. on it. Yes. Yeah, has, she's decorated it. She's That's right. drawn a piece of art on it. Yeah, and it looks it looks like something you could buy at Target. It's happy. It looks designed. It, yeah. Um, I received the only thing I asked for, which was a lamp that I saw on Twitter. And I found the, the guy who makes it on Etsy, and I forwarded it to an elf. 
and the elf <laughs> contacted him and, and found and like he doesn't actually stock them anymore. Okay, but got him to send one, and it's a beautiful wooden lamp with an Edison bulb on top and a dimmer and a voltage meter on the front. So wow. when you dim it, when you turn it up, you yeah. watch. It's like a you know seventy year old voltage meter. Right, right. It, it actually shows you how much power you're using. It's just like an. But it's an LED lamp. That's great. No, it is actually. A, it it's wouldn't in, use the voltage if it were an LED lamp. Oh, so it's incandescent. It, it would just stay yeah. at zero. Right, right. <laughs> right. So it actually, does it flicker to life? No. It just, it just gets brighter. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It gets a little bit brighter. Well, as, okay. That's interesting. Uh, yeah, as the uh, dimmer goes, you know, you turn it up. It gets. Oh. I did get one thing that was quite memorable. I got face socks. Somebody, uh, of those? Uh, one of Wendy's family members got me a pair of socks with my face on them. <laughs> <laughs> and it's like repeating images of, of my face. Right. And we all got pairs of socks with our own faces on them. You're kidding. And I was like, what is this? Uh, we're all horrified and amazed at the same time. Wow. This is the world we live in. You too can have your face you on You know, some socks. I think that was like a trend this year. Um, our friend Gary, I think he got his wife a rubber stamp with her face on it. Uh-huh. So you can actually stamp your, your face on things. Mm-hmm. Danica got me a t shirt and post it notes with her Bitmoji face on it. Wow. Yeah. Customize stocking stuffers and gifts. Mm hmm. It's. Yeah. Things remembered in the 2020s. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Uh, you give any good things? Did I what? Give any good things, things that you're proud of. Probably. You wrapped everything m- a month I, ago. I just want to let you know that I'm doing Pilates, as defined by Jeremy, because we've been doing Ring Fit Adventure. Did you get that? I did get that for yeah. a kid. Oh uh, it is really, it's weirdly fun. Yeah. Uh, my, my, uh... You don't want to say. I don't want to say. Okay. <laughs> it's, it's, <laughs> too, it's, too sen- it's too sentimental. Oh, yeah, for this show. And you don't want to be. You don't want to be known as a sentimental person. No. You don't no. let me know. Jeremy no. is a hard ass. Yeah. Cold hearted, not right. sentimental. Uh, all right. I gave up a, a Polaroid camera. Uh, you gave one. Yeah. 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 I got a Polaroid camera. You got one. No, I gave one. You gave one. I gave one. I get to take the photos. That's also part of the gift. I see. Because I did. Yeah, that's interesting. Taking okay. the photos is part of the gift. How and how much does it cost to do a Polaroid photo? Uh, it depends where you buy the the film from, but it's basically eighty cents a, a picture. Right okay. Now. Yeah. So Fuji, it, Fuji Max, basically. Yeah. So Fuji it, film. Every shot has to kind of count. I that's mean, that's the reason to have it. Will is giving me shit about that. He's like, oh, I have a digital camera. I can take infinite number of photos. That's, I, right. I, that's great. I have that too. But it's the it's a completely different experience. Yeah, and you, it's fun to watch the photos fade in, and you know it's chemicals, and they 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 look different than the photos you would take exposed differently. Yeah, uh, and the one that came out a year ago, the SQ, the square one, the SQ six, uh, I think you get it for like eighty bucks uh, anywhere online. I, I really enjoyed it. I've been enjoying using it nice. last week. Yeah. All right. Enough chitty chat. Hope everyone had a great uh, Christmas as well and New Year. Mm-hmm. But let's get to. Story this week. There really was not a lot to go on this past week. I mean, I wasn't really on the internet. Not not a lot to. No, and it's really news. it's really it's two weeks because last week we really discovered Half Life Alex things. and right. Star Wars. Exactly, exactly. So, yeah, and, I, and, I, and I went over. I realized that I, not only have I done nothing, the rest of the world's done nothing either. It's just a, it's the downtime. Yes, the holidays. Yes, um, I, I have to struggle. That it takes me like concentrated effort to realize what day it is. <laughs> During, I don't. I really don't know, and I arrived there through deduction. Like I know it's not the that weekend. happens to me, but because I have a baby. No, oh, I see. Yeah, come on, this guy has to be the top story of the week, right? So, top story. I get to put you. Ooh, spoiler <laughs> alert. <laughs> top. Let's, let's we'll talk about more Star Wars. Now we're not going to talk about the Rise of Skywalker. That's been talked ever to again. Death. Yeah. For let's give them. I mean, there's got to be like a moratorium on that for like. Four months okay. till till I, the Blu-ray release. Right? Uh, no, I'm just gonna say forever, forever. I've had okay. enough of All Rise right. of Skywalker okay. time. Okay, but we can talk plenty about mm-hmm. the Mandalorian, yeah. which had its season finale, season one finale in the states because, of course, it's not over uh, released over in the UK yet. Uh, a week and a half ago, it was the week of Christmas. Uh, episode eight came out, and loved it. It, it stuck the landing. Totally nailed the landing. It built up to something, and it was it was fantastic. Taika Waititi directed, and it mm-hmm. felt like a Taika Waititi 
directed thing. Much more humor than some of the other episodes. Yep. And I actually was worried that that wasn't going to mesh well with how kind of serious and almost heavy some of the other episodes was, but it it totally worked. You know, I, watching that bit, because it does open with, uh, we're not going to go into too many plot details, but it does open with a little bit of a more lighthearted sketch moment. Uh, there's a cameo voiced by Jason Stakis, and maybe he was in the costume, not exactly Who sure. Um, he was an SNL, uh, mm-hmm. 30 Rock, okay. uh, comedic actor, a lot of movies, uh, but he played... One of those. One of the troopers. Yep, yep. The other one is played by Adam Pally, another comedian. And it made me think of like a lot of the show, it gives just a lot of credit should be given to the Star Wars fan films that kind of help, I think, pave the way for fans to accept this tone for Star Wars. You know, decades ago we had, do you remember Troops? Yes. I I told Peter about that after we watched this episode. And this was very much uh, reminiscent of of Troops. Absolutely. I, I, but... Yeah, and but better. <laughs> oh, of course, of course. Uh, directed by a real Hollywood director with real budget, real real locations. Yeah, and, and that the the blaster bit had me cracking up. Yeah, I yeah. mean that was hilarious. Yeah, and and th- that even though it is canon, it is completely irreverent. Yes, and doesn't take itself seriously, and it would have no place, I think, on a, in a in a episode, you know, Star Skywalker saga. At movie. least, at least not in the original trilogy. Like when they were taking it seriously. Yeah. <laughs> this actually only works because we don't binge it because it's on a weekly. Because the last episode ended on kind of a a big cliffhanger, tonally kind of devastating. Yeah. And if you flow right into without a break into this tonally, I think it would have been kind of jarring. But because we had the week break, yeah, because I, there was a cliffhanger, we can have yeah. Uh, I think it, it it totally played, and it it was uh, fantastic, and it amped up how ridiculous what we saw in the previous episode was when you stepped away from it for a second. I th- I thought like that opening bit was the best part of the whole show. Really? And, uh, yeah, and I I want that. I want to see a show about stormtroopers, just you know, rank and file yeah. stormtroopers going through their day trying to stay you know on what? the good on the good side of their superior. And maybe shoot something once in a while. It was something that would have fit very well in an SNL sketch. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, and you know, Jason Segel was an SNL actor, but you know, there was that uh, classic SNL now classic SNL bit with, with um, Adam Driver playing the undercover boss Kylo Ren. Yeah, right. And it, was, it felt of that of that bit. It, it remind it, it made me realize we've never seen a, a full out like official Star Wars comedy. Mm-hmm. And you know, and mm-hmm. and I feel like we're ready for it. I feel like people have been ready for it since the Lego games. Right. Where it's really kind of, you know, punchy. Not take itself too seriously yeah. once again. Mm-hmm. Which Star Wars is, is fine for because like you said, there it's Star Wars has been kind of retold in so many different mediums with so many different storytellers. Uh, there's no reason that, that it well, couldn't be I think a horror film, a comedy. This Star Wars it can do that because the stakes are a lot smaller. That like the big films. When, when you it's say like, stakes, you also mean like the money stakes too. Yes, like uh, both. It, it doesn't need sure. to make a billion and a half dollars. But also, it's not like the fate of the universe hangs in the balance where it, it's although, hard. To, although, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. The stakes are it, canonically the stakes are pretty high in the Mandalorian. They 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 do the whole the whole story is around you know a. a the, theoretically very important figure. The child. People know about the child. The child. What's called the child. The child. Yeah. Yeah. I have not seen you respond to the stakes of anything Star Wars more so than the child in oh, Mandalorian. Loved it. Yeah. Still love it. <laughs> I mean, I I it shows like during that scene with um early in the thing, I got irrationally mad that the that the baby was in any sort of danger. Oh, the beginning of this yeah. one where they're yeah. And and let's again not spoiling any details, but I was like I was horrified. I was yelling at the television. I uh, you and my, I called in my wife to be like, I need to hit pause on this, and we need to talk for a second. Oh, I think you and my son would would have uh, commiserated together about that. What did you guys think about Moff Gideon? I uh, anytime Gene Carlo Esposito walks on screen, I'm like, oh, that's that's how a villain looks and acts and feels. Mm. Yeah. What I loved about the character is he he rings true of an intelligence officer. Uh, and you would think something like the Empire has like an intelligent office unit. 
and he doesn't pretend. He seems ruthless and um, and intelligent and just perfect. He's everything that Hux wasn't. Right. Yeah. I mean, if for for space Nazis, he is the representative of the SS for space. Right. Yeah. I loved he he delivered every line so eloquently and w- w- just well. I liked I loved his character, and, but apparently, the big reveal at the end of his uh you know well, his, what the thing yes what the thing he, he has. what he has yes. Uh, that means something to Star Wars fans. That was yeah. one of those cases where I was not clued into that. You hadn't but, watched that cartoon. No, I had not. But I, I then digging into it afterward, yeah. I'm sure it resonated much more with those people who would watch Rebels and, and Clone Wars. Clone Wars specifically. Yeah, mm-hmm. and, uh, my son had. I haven't watched Clone Wars. It makes me want to go back and revisit them. They're all mm-hmm. on Disney+. Plus, I guess. And another season of Clone Wars is coming out yeah. on Disney+, Plus in 2020. So it all kind of meshes together very good very good so a plus season rating for mandalorian i a, think a. You, a well from you i i'm, bet, I'm betting it's not because you, you I, think, I would still call it a minus i think they stuck that's the still a territory it's a territory wow so yeah. well that tells me a lot about people were not happy with a minuses when you were a child <laughs> <laughs> no they were not <laughs> uh, but i could i could imagine that they still learned a lot from this series, and they have things that they want to improve on. Oh, pacing, sure. Yeah, and so I, I, I think season two is going to be even better. Yeah, and it's it's a show that I think people love. The, the, the bottle episode works really well in the show, and I'm going to go reference back to it when we talk about The Witcher in pop culture. I do want to compare those two. Uh, I hope I know they spend a lot of money on the show, but I hope they get even more leeway to use that money in in more interesting ways too, yeah. and show us something new. I saw one take on Twitter that that just keeps ringing true is like we we keep calling the Mandalorian a Western just because of the music and Mm. the theming, but it's really an Eastern. It derives more inspiration from samurai films from uh, from a number of uh, of of Japanese films Mm. than from Westerns. And and that's true even with like some of the comedy bits, I think, too. Mm. So uh, I'm seeing I'm curious if they're going to change tonally. At all, like draw inspiration from from other sources, bring in new directors. Yeah, and season two, I think that's uh, I'm really excited about that. What that means? That's so funny because you it, such so much of the criticism that has been on the Rise of Skywalker has been the inco you know the, the incongruous directing styles between J.J. Abrams and Ryan Johnson, and then back to J.J. Abrams, and the fact that it's not a one unified vision, but for the Mandalorian, there were so many different. You could tell that there were different directors and different voices telling these stories, and it was totally fine. It, it's because it's the Kevin Feige. We always had a plan. Like the story felt congruous. All, it was all even Dave if Filoni, the, John Favreau overarching yeah. plan. Uh, even if the the stylistically it, it changed, I think people are open to that. Do you want to talk about the picture John Fadro tweeted out, which is sitting behind us? Yeah, so uh, the other big news, top story this week, is Mandalorian Season 2, of course, has been greenlit. There's been uh, a, r- a rough timing. It's going to be released fall 2020, right. so hopefully that will be global release and everyone around the world gets to see it at the same time. Uh, but the first kind of pre-production image uh, John Favreau tweeted out is what it looks like uh, a uh, Jabba's Palace Guard. Pig guard. What is the name of that character? What is the species? Gamorian. Gamorian That's guard. Right. It's quite a lean Gamorian guard. So I, I don't know what that means. I don't know if it will be uh, more like like uh, an IG-11 type character callback to the original series or if it's just a character design that's going to pop up, you know, one off like um, some of the uh, the bounty hunters that the man learned dispatched of. Well, I'm... I'm- Curious if this means like we get into like a Jabba type universe where it's more of a mob type uh, setting versus a uh, a kind of like an old west type setting. You yeah, mean, well, I mean those things can come together. Yeah, easily. I mean, that's right. What Star Wars you you have the classic, you know, the, the Rango storyline, right? The mm-hmm. the town being held hostage by organized crime, water. You know, in this case, it could be. Fuel or what up, whatever. Spice. Spice, exactly. Spice. Uh, let's move on to our next section. Pop culture. 
Okay. Okay. It sounds like none of us watched the same things over the break. Oh, yeah? But we're going to try to cover them as well. Mm-hmm. Um, well, let's talk about some, some, some news stuff and pop culture news, because that's what the, the music said. Uh, WandaVision, which is the second Disney plus Marvel Studios show, the first one being Captain um, uh, Winter Soldier and the F- Falcon Winter Soldier, uh, that has now been moved up to... Uh, also, end of year 2020, this year, we're going to get both Falcon and Winter Soldier and WandaVision mm-hmm. and by Man- the end of this year and Mandalorian Season yeah. 2. Disney Plus is going for a real big Clone end of War- year 2020 uh, subscriber boost. Clone Wars is coming out on uh, the, the new season. There's Lizzie McGuire coming out this season. No. Is, is that a thing? Yeah, it was an old Disney. Well, show. what is going to hold people over, tie people over from now until then? Toy Story Four, it's like some of the out, movies. Right? Yeah, okay. Lion King, I guess. No, but those aren't on Disney Plus. Oh, so things were leaving Netflix or mm-hmm. they're leaving uh, VOD and and getting right yeah. onto Disney Plus. Hmm. Yeah, original content wise, I don't know. I'm more don't. I'm almost like I. I know they need to launch strong with you know, as much content as they could. And they had. The High School Musical thing. They had the uh, Imagineering story. Um, they had the One Day at Disney thing. You know, but I, I almost wish that they would have staggered some of that stuff out because yeah, the next six months at least till the summer, unless you have kids and you need to watch all the old stuff to keep them entertained. Yeah. What 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 keeps someone subscribed? Yeah, I wonder. I, that's also why I think they they really went with the annual package. They really pushed. Annual packages, so people aren't mm-hmm. we're just paying seven bucks a month. Or just, I'm locked in for three years. Three, yeah. <laughs> exactly right. So I think as a whole, it'll, it'll, it'll be worth it. Okay. But very exciting that Marvel Studios is moving along. Uh, there was also news in the Marvel Studios world that Deadpool three is now in production. I'm a little hot. It sounds like I'm a little hot. Uh, but Deadpool three is in production and under the Marvel Studios banner. So uh, Ryan Reynolds said that th- they are moving forward, and that was a, a kind of a little bit of a question mark because that was a Fox property and we knew that it was so successful that they would have to, you know, that they would have to continue along, but would it be a Marvel Studios film? And Deadpool felt like it would be the right character to to kind of... Are we going to get cable? Why wouldn't we get cable? I mean, that's what they teased. I mean, I don't know. I mean, we had cable in, in Deadpool 2. What, are you talking yeah. about another character? I think, I think uh, what's his name? Oh, you, so you, are you saying that is Josh Bowling going to play Double Duty? Yeah. I mean, Thanos is no longer an issue. Uh, I guess And he so. was just a voice. So, yeah. Yeah. I think we'll get Cable. Or are they just going to do... Like, I don't know what the the next thing in Deadpool is. Just being Deadpool, I guess. I got to tell you, I don't either. Did you ever see Deadpool 2? Yeah. I think I have only seen Deadpool 2. Oh. Yeah. Well, it's, it was really enjoyable. I thought so. Yeah. Yep. Uh, and it'll, it's it hopefully still be rated R. Because it, it, it's a it's a movie that deserves you know. The, when you say hopefully, you think that's an option? I mean, they couldn't possibly do PG thirteen and get away with it. Do you do you think? I think they could. You think? I think that they, if they wrote around it, they they could. Ryan Reynolds would be interested in that. Yeah, I think he'd still want to do it. Mm. I, I don't think he'd be super happy about it. Hmm. But it's like he has that um, the Free Guy movie coming out, and that's I think PG thirteen and has a lot right. of meta awareness that Deadpool Deadpool has. Those are very similar tone movies, I think. Going for the same kind of audience. Um, trailers, new trailers that are out. Christopher Nolan's next film is coming out this year. It's called Tenant. And there was a first trailer. I don't understand what's going on in the trailer. I heard it's his most ambitious film ever. That's what I heard. How, story-wise? Um, it, maybe. Maybe in terms of effects. Filming? Like, Honestly, the effects don't wow me like Inception. Like, the things... Rooms did, aren't turning upside down? Or folding. You know? <laughs> like, uh... The the tenant trailer appears to be some sort of time warping abil- yeah. abilities. Where right. in the in the trailer, I think it's a trailer. When I saw uh, Rise of Skywalker, they actually showed a whole scene. Oh, from the movie and I, I an IMAX. I, I saw it. I saw it in IMAX, and they showed the whole. I don't know if it's the opening scene like they did for Batman. Yeah, but they showed an entire scene, and so I, I think that what I'm thinking right now is actually just from the trailer. Uh, where an agent is, uh, you know, put in a position where he can give people up, doesn't, and then gets sort of brought back to life. Yes. And uh, it then is embowed with some sort of superpower to warp backwards through time or forwards through time while everything else is going backwards. 
Right. Mm. And and the way it's filmed, it looks seamless from the trailer where there are these stunts that look like they are going in reverse, but they're acting forward. Exactly. It's like the, that scene, do you remember that movie, um, was it Top Secret? A Val Kilmer movie? It was a comedy. It was a satire. Yeah. There, there's a whole scene in that that was filmed backwards, but they acted forwards. So they had to reverse their whole role. Oh, really? Yeah. That's cool. And it feels like they're yeah. doing that, except as opposed to filming the scenes backwards, they're just doing it some type of special effect. Because it does look like reversed footage. Like it, it looks like mixed footage of forwards right. and reverse. It looks like some composite where yeah. people, some people are going backwards and some people are going forwards, or they're doing both. Like the whole rappelling from a building instead of re, like they're climbing up a building, but yeah. they're doing it in a way it looks like it's rewinding the rappelling down from. Oh, the I building. didn't get that. That's interesting. Okay, because I guess what they're the interesting twist is they have to investigate these issues, these events, yeah, re, in reverse order. Mm. So they see the aftermath, and then they have to figure out what's about to happen. That seems sounds very Christopher Nolan. I yeah. mean, that was that was the, almost the conceit of uh, from the viewer's perspective of Memento. You're watching it unfold backwards. I need to go back and revisit Memento because I wrote it off at the time. You wrote it off at the yeah, time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh I said this God. is Memento is great. I said this is gimmicky. I, I'm not even. Gonna, I don't even think I finished it. Oh, so wow. I, yeah, I need to go okay. back. Yeah, because okay. Inception is absolutely one of my favorite movies. There you go. The I mean, I think when you realize the when the gimmickiness hits and you realize what Carrie Ann Moss's performance is is happening, really, it's incredible. Okay. Yeah, it's one that you want to watch again immediately after you watch it. Yeah. Because there's so much subtlety in it. And nonlinear storytelling. That's actually going to be a theme of uh, a thing later. Uh, so there's also a trailer for Quiet Place 2. This is the movie that John Krasinski said he wasn't going to do until, I guess, they put enough money in front of him and his family. And <laughs> I guess so they, they did. Said, okay, I'll direct it. Emily Blunt's going to be in it. And also, Killian Murphy's in it now. So it is a follow-up to uh, what happened after immediately after Quiet Place 1. There's a baby now involved. How are you going to keep that baby quiet? That's going to be the most unrealistic thing about this movie. Uh, you probably didn't see Quiet Place, did you? I did see a Quiet did Place. You? Wow, because I didn't think you liked the scary movies any more than I did. Uh, that was tense, but not super scary. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah, it was, it was good. It was really good. I'm curious if this has legs. Like the creatures, the, the creatures do have legs. I've seen. Well, them. <laughs> I mean, if this the, this the, whole the story, yeah. yeah, because I think part of the reason Quiet Place was successful is it it kind of came out of nowhere, mm -hmm. low expectations, right. kind of indie hit. It it's like also released at the right time, all that kind of stuff. It, it's a conceit that if you unravel too much, it does it doesn't work, right? Like you know, they could just live by waterfalls, and the creatures wouldn't harass them because everything is so loud in the water around the water, right? Like, you know, <laughs> why live on the farm in the, where it's actually quiet? That Does, doesn't really work. Um, what's this about uh, Mythic Quest? Uh, it's a, that's a, uh, a, a TV show that's coming out on Apple TV, which is about game developers. Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay. I did, I did, actually, I put this on notes. From, wow, this is from like two weeks ago. Mm -hmm. uh, Silicon Valley is done. And I don't think we've had a successful comedy kind of do for Silicon Valley, uh, do for game development, what Silicon Valley did for app development. And I, th I think there could be a lot of potential in this. Is, wait, so is this real or is this a comedy? It's, it's a comedy. Oh. And it, it's from um, Rob McElhaney and Charlie Day, who are from It's Always Sunny in Philadelphia. They're executive producers on it. Whoa. Yeah, so they have like serious people behind it. Uh, and there, there's an incredible cast, uh, like weird people that you wouldn't expect. So Danny Pudi, who is in Community, yeah, Community, who is in Captain America: Winter Soldier, F. Murray Abraham what? from Amadeus. How did those two people go together? I don't know. And, and Last Action Hero. Oh yes, that's right. Uh, who knows what this will be? But <laughs> Apple Plus has been so inconsistent. Yeah. I, I, I don't I know what to make of this, but these are great creative types behind this move. This and, and there's been news recently, Apple Plus, I think Apple's kind of reevaluating after the 
first big release of Apple. They've already greenlit the season two for a bunch of the shows that they released, so they want to keep some momentum going, but they recently hired an ex-HBO exec to develop the original programming, so they want to bring more of that HBO DNA to their prestige programming. But I think they're also looking at acquisitions, straight up acquisitions like Netflix and Amazon have done in which they don't necessarily control from the ground up the creative for a show and they go and do what studios have done and go to a film festival or, or a, go to an a international market and buy up the rights to distribute some things that, that, that they don't have to, it doesn't have to be as risky for them. Like what does it mean, don't know what it means for there to be an Apple TV plus exclusive show. Like that just means that Apple had a lot of money and they gave some creators a lot of money to do whatever they want. It doesn't have the same resonance as even an Amazon Prime show now these days. So they still have a long, long ways to go. Um, and we're all subscribed for at least another year, I guess, right? The free year. I'm still in the middle of my free I year. I did not get a phone this year. So. Oh, maybe next year. Maybe next if they year. If they still offer hey, there'll be that a, promotion. There'll be all the old stuff plus all the new stuff. Oh, yeah, yeah. That's... Uh, Picard... It's coming out in less than three, exactly almost three weeks from now. Three weeks from now. Three wow. weeks is surprising the date my CBS All Access subscription is going to start. Oh, weird, fantastic. Weird how that timing yeah. worked out. <laughs> I'm, I'm in um, information black hole for Picard. I'm Same. Just, I'm not reading anything. The big question I, I have right now is what the opening theme is going to be. Oh, good question. Can we do a viewing party? Yeah. For the premiere? I've been rewatching a lot of Next Gen just to prime myself okay. for like the for cards a lot of watching a lot of Picard episodes. Yeah. Oh, I'm going in cold. Go I'm going in super cold to not over no. inflate the Picard character more than it already is in my mind. I mean, you gotta watch like you gotta watch uh Descent part one and two. Why? I Borg. I mean, I understand why, but why? Like because I've Next seen Gen's those fun to watch. I know I like yes. Yes, but gotta I don't be, need to build up the expectations for this series anymore. Yeah, you got to you got to be careful. You got to lower your expectations. Watch oh. watch some Picard stuff, Patrick Stewart stuff you don't like. I don't think that exists. Oh, I'm sure it does. <laughs> he was in Charlie's Angels, this n- new one. Maybe you should watch that. X Men Three. X Men. There, there you go. go. There you go. That's I found. Sorry, the one thing. X Men Three. X Men United. How That's long the are the episodes? Watch. Do we know that yet? But they're full full hour long episodes. Hour long episodes. Yeah. Oh, like. 40, 40, yeah. 42 to 60 minutes. Outstanding. Yeah. There, it's going to be an hour long show, quote unquote. Commercial free. I mean, CBS All Access. So, yeah. yes, commercial free. Because it will be syndicated elsewhere outside the US, not on uh, CBS All Access. So, uh, there might be commercials in other markets. Um, and uh, we have one piece of uh, kind of really sad news uh, Sid Mead, um, artist, concept designer. Um, kind of created the visual language of a lot of the films of the 80s, passed away this past week. Um, and uh, it's just, it's worth going back and looking at how influential he was in a lot of the pieces. You know, Blade Runner, you know, as influential as Ralph McQuarrie was for Star Wars, so that's what Sid Mead was for for Blade Runner. And also on things like Star Trek Motion Picture. Are there, is there like a uh, artist compendium of like Sid Mead's work somewhere? Yes, like there, a is, book? there is, there is, there's one on, I think just the vehicles, I want to say. And yeah, but there are definitely a few um, just Sid Mead art books worth picking up. Yeah. Uh, I mean, he was still working, you know, recently. It wasn't like he retired and, and had kind of disappeared. He was doing interviews. He was engaging with people. We know a lot of people in the extended tested family who had either worked with him um, or had, you know, you know who had, been uh, collaborators, um, but yeah, it's kind of uh, kind of sad. I wonder what a guy like that wants done with his body. You know, does he want to be cremated? Does he want to be buried in some sort of like sci-fi coffin? Does he want to be shot into space? I wonder. He's probably he's probably thought about that. I, I mean, hasn't everyone? No. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I don't know if, if you know, most I want to be in the cookies. A lot of people just do the traditional thing. They just yeah. do what is done. Right. right. I think somebody yeah. like this must think outside the box. You don't want to be shot onto a, a generic planet that might be um, filled, hit with the Genesis device much later on. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, I can see that. Or or be you know, driven away in, into the sunset on a, on a cyber truck. 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder, he must have liked the Cybertruck. Uh, he, he, there's a Business Insider story that where he corresponded over email with some reporters and said that he liked the design. Oh, but cool. he could have just been being polite. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Not sure. I, I, think, li- I think a lot of people regard his designs as much superior to Cybertruck design, <laughs> but I think the influence is 100% there. I mean, Elon Musk has said as much with the Blade Runner theming yep. of the event. So I'm glad he got to see at least the Cybertruck and, mm-hmm. and part of his visual styling um, become a reality. Uh, and then two TV shows I want to give recommendations and talk about. One, I want to talk about The Witcher. Really? I do, because I really like this show. I, I, I'm surprised that this show has gotten as much praise as it has. Because when I saw it announced, I was like, this is going to be a train wreck. Because they're going to bounce around between the timelines, right? So, wait, so you've already... St- I'm not going to go into spoilers, but I haven't read the books and I never played the games. I went into this as looking for a new fantasy show to kind of fill the void of Game of Thrones. And that was one of the promises. And it's not Game of Thrones, at least not yet. It doesn't have all the intrigue. It's some The pilot, I think, is a little weak. The action is fantastic. The action choreography. Henry Cavill owns the role. I mean, plays a character that has no emotion, which great for an actor with not a ton ton of range let's say but the wig looks good he has the physique of a of a of a, of a crazy uh, or of a, of a, um, uh, a merc for hire with with mystical powers uh he can pull off all the action you know there's no the action scenes aren't don't look like there's a stunt double and then him like it's like it's clearly he's doing these these stunts um at least they edit it really well and the fact that it follows it follows three characters him uh, this young girl, Siri, and then this sorceress, uh, Yennefer. Of course, those of you who've played the game or read the books will know these characters. But the way in which it follows the three characters, I think is really novel. And it, the, if you go into it cold, you'll be really happy. So okay. go into it cold. I'm only uh, halfway through this se- uh, season, four episodes in. A lot of people have complained that it's really slow, a slow start, and that's, I think, true. It also is funny, it doesn't take itself so seriously. There's there's a bard character. With like, like an the, actual an lute or actual something? actual playing a lute, singing songs, and he's an essential part of the plot, and not enough fantasy shows and movies have bards in well, them. Well, Rothfuss's Name of the Wind is getting options, so we'll get well, a sure lot a more lot lute. Of, a lot of lute and a lot of, a lot of, a lot of bards and a lot of singing. Uh Okay, okay. You can, you convinced me on and, The Witcher. And I, I do want to go back to how it compares to The Mandalorian because both shows are about these loners who are also badasses. And I got to say, at least the first, through the first four episodes, I like the first four episodes of The Witcher more than the first four episodes of The Mandalorian, partly because it doesn't have the burden of Star Wars on it and there's not the expectations. It's a different type of world building. But also just the portrayal of a loner badass, or, you know, uh, Merc for Hire, I think Henry Cavill does a better job and the showrunners have done a better job of creating someone who like who looks like they could they could take on any job mm-hmm. and um and doesn't just get beat up. Did either of you play the Witcher games? No. 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 Okay. Me neither. Yeah. Interesting. You know, I mean I'm not, that's I'm not invested at all. I mean, maybe that's it. Yeah. I have no expectations and go in and the money is on the screen uh, and and the effects look good and the makeup effects are really good and also it's not directly like serialized in a way and this is where it does share something with the Mandalorians it almost has this cold open there's like these nice little time jumps between the episodes mm. and so the passing of time allows you don't need to see you know every minute of this character's life he can go on a quest and then the next episode it could be a couple months later with a whole new quest mm. and an overarching story that ties the whole season together all right the witcher recommended the witcher. by norm totally. what's the other show the other show is an Amazon Prime show called Undone. Mm-hmm. Uh, Gary had uh, recommended this heavily on Twitter, and then also um, friend of Tested, uh, the Vindra Hardware of Engadget. They named it one of uh, the best shows of the decade. So I initially had dismissed it a little bit um, because it, it's a rotoscope animated show, and I'm like, ah, do I, does, is it rotoscope because for a reason? And one, it, one, it earns the rotoscoping, it, they they make great use of it. Uh, it's just to, as a visual. You mean a, the animation style similar to Waking Life and A Scanner Darkly, but mo- done in, with modern technology. So they, I, I presume, they filmed it with live actors 
on location or at least in a big sound stage, and then applied CG and drawn art on top of that. That's what they did with those movies. But the way they've applied it, it looks like it. it it's, it has its own stylized look. Okay. And there's some trippiness to it. Hmm. Uh, the main actress is Rosa Salazar, who did, I think she was in the Maze Runner, but she most recently did Battle Angel Alita. She played Alita. So a lot of performance capture, motion capture work there already. Uh, and then Bob Odenkirk is in the oh, show. Huh. And he is fantastic. They're both fantastic. It's, how do I sell the story in a way that you'll, that it, you'll there's just you one to season, watch. right? Hour long episodes? They're half hour long episodes. Half, how many episodes? Eight. You can watch the oh, whole easy. thing in an evening, which that's I did. Easy. I binged in four hours. <laughs> Jeez. Wow. And, and I was watching the finale as New Year tur- turned over yeah. uh, two days ago. That was your first tweet of the New Year, right? Yeah. Happy New Year. Now go watch, watch Undone. Because I was <laughs> in the middle of finishing that show and I'm like, whoa, this show is incredible. Um, I don't want to spoil it. It's another show that people should go in cold. But there's some good science fiction elements in it. Okay. There's time. Right. There's time bending, and it's w- really well written, to, to, to with non-linear storytelling. Would you say it is science fiction? Yes. Okay. Yes. If that gets you to watch the show, yes. Undone. Undone on Amazon. I think they're going to do a second season of that too. Although I don't think it needs it. Not at all. All right. On to, oh, actually, before we move to technology news, I want to let you know that this episode of This Is Only a Test is made possible by Caseda Smart Lighting Systems from Lutron. A lot of people think you need smart bulbs to get smart lighting, but there is a smarter way. Caseda's smart dimmers and switches place a switch in your wall so that all lights controlled by the switch will act smart. Think about all the places in your home where one switch controls multiple bulbs, ceiling lights, chandeliers, bathrooms, and more. With Caseda, you'll save money by replacing the switches instead of replacing all the bulbs because smart bulbs are only smart when the switch is on. If someone flips it off, you can say goodbye to that smart control and connectivity. But Caseda switches are always smart even if the switch is off. With Caseda dimmers, you don't need to buy smart bulbs to enjoy the smart lighting. You get the best of both worlds, smart lighting control from an app or your voice and control right at the switch. Which the voice control is one of the best parts for sure. And there are extra features like smart away feature, which randomly turns lights and on during the evening to look like you're at home when you're not. And you can, of course, use your voice assistance to get control for your lights. So if your arm is full, like if you're holding a baby trying to get them to sleep, get smart lighting the smart way with Caseda by Lutron Smart Switches. Learn more about Caseda at Lutron.com slash test. Once again, that's Lutron.com slash test. <laughs> Ooh, where do we want to start with technology? Hmm. There wasn't a ton, but I got to start with something that kind of pissed me off in a pretty big way. So I use a lot of Wise cameras around the house. Yeah, they're webcams. They're, they're super cheap. They're cheap. They're like twenty five bucks. So you can even find them on sale for twenty bucks. Uh, they had an account uh, breach. Basically, an employee had left uh, production servers in a situation that they essentially weren't password protected, and it leaked a ton of data. And I got one of those like standard, oh, we're sorry letters. But it was like, it was just a tone deaf apology letter. And it just made me mad. It's like, it was a camera company. And when they had a data leak of 2.4 million people's data, it was just like, it was like, it, it occurred to me as a stuff happens sometimes kind of email. And uh, we're in this territory now where, like, with cameras and the voice-activated systems, data leaks are much more personal than they used to be. And so while they didn't, uh, according to WISE, they didn't leak any video files or anything else like that, they did um, leak uh, some of the Alexa integration tokens uh, that were there, which is terrifying. Um some of the um uh, your like router name your like all of this mm. other information about mm-hmm. your home that isn't central to the camera itself yeah uh it's the first time i've had like a moment of pause around some of the connected devices in my home and i think it it heralds i i mean not to get too far out in front of a of a privacy reckoning that's going to come with like IoT devices. We all feel. I think the momentum is definitely shifting there, and it's not like, you know, 
this company holds more data about you than any other company that you use on the reg, whether it's Google, Apple, or Amazon. But because it is a camera company, and we this is on top of all the concerns about you know, Ring and the, uh, the video files that they're sharing with law enforcement, and people just understand like the purpose of a video camera is potentially for surveillance. Like this resonates a lot more, even though you're right, they didn't share the video data, but all the companies working that working with your data, uh, which basically almost any internet connect company right now should be held, held to higher standards than they currently are. We got my son uh, requested for Christmas smart lights, RGB smart lights that you can plug into any plug and then control the color of through your Amazon device or through an app. And we put them throughout the house and they're a ton of fun. And um, then I started looking into the things you could do with it. And it turns out that there's a whole community of people who have reflashed the firmware on these to stop them from phoning home, to stop them from having uh, internet or connectivity with the mothership. And you can just isolate it to your own LAN and you essentially like run your own server and control everything the same way, but without that umbilical to the internet. So that That's is cool. It's, really like geeky though you gotta run a server on your phone and you know put it into pairing mode and you know learn how to reflash it so it's it's all very difficult at the moment but i hope that that becomes easier and over time you know it becomes uh something that any consumer maybe even legally is entitled to be able to, hmm. to do regulation yeah uh, from that, uh, wow, let's talk about some cars, interconnected cars. Uh, Tesla got a big update. Tesla cars, um, the fleet got a big update. Uh, Stardew Valley's now on there. That is nice a great idea. Like I can't imagine a better game the, to have on there because that is a long-term commitment. Like you can pull into a charging station and just start up your game and continue playing it. And it's not too big so that it's not, they, they don't just have to give you chapter one. I'm so unconvinced still about the viability of games in Tesla systems as more than a novelty. Like, totally I know it's what not it where they it, it, it still feels very much like a novelty to me. Who at, I, I don't, I've never seen anyone at a charging station actually play these games for serious. Really? Like everyone's on their phones if they're in their cars. Yeah. Uh, and and cuz it's a nice size screen. Like you can really you can do that. I imagine if I were but to ergonomically take, like, interacting with the center console. If I were to take a road trip and I were plugged into a to a station, I'd I'd play that. Are you sure you want to just be on your phone or playing the same equivalent game on your iPad? If like I'm like most people, I'm probably doing both. <laughs> it's a it is the second screen. Yeah. For for your car, uh, but there were a bunch of um, other updates that were pushed uh, out for um, for Tesla cars. You're seeing more and more the inching toward the full, full, uh, full autonomy, and the visualizations now show turn signal or turn lanes and things like handicap spots, and what? so a lot of the computer vision stuff is what? appearing in the visualizations whoa, now. Whoa, whoa. What are you talking about? The turn lanes. Turn lane. You know how like some lanes are turn only. Yeah. Yeah. That that appears in your visualization of the lane next to you. Wow. So it, the, it gets that visually. It doesn't have it, a, a database to, of that. All of it has to be visually. Even the speed limit stuff is visually. And, what, and the handicap spots when you're in a parking lot, it yeah. knows which spots are... It, it looking, if, if it's open. Yeah. It knows, yeah. It's, it's, is there a way wow. to like correct against that? Like, is there a way you can say like, no, that's incorrect or something like that? Is it self I don't think you can send, send the feedback. But I, I do think, I don't think it's working on visual alone. I do think that it's combining visual with with a database. Because Google Maps has that database of like turn lanes mm -hmm. somewhere for their directions, right? I don't know so, that's in the API though that they're yeah. sharing with, with Tesla. True. Inching towards there, full autonomy. There's yes. a couple other like uh, vehicle news. So Tesla announced they shipped the first three Model 3s from their China factory. Yeah. They went to employees, um, which is a big landmark to have because it means increased capacity for the, for the cars. Uh, and potentially like more global shipping. I imagine these cars are for Asia. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, but it like the increased capacity is pretty significant too. Uh, so I think that's a pretty important milestone. My son has gotten obsessed with electric vehicles. He's like, when are we getting an electric vehicle? And he's picked out the Chevy Bolt as the car he wants. Oh wow, Jeremy, you win. 
mostly because he saw a neon green one. Like you could see it from space. You this mean, car was so bright. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's actually a discontinued color. Oh no. That was one year Don't only. Tell him. That was one year only. And it, that's a great color. But I I've been curious if like we're gonna see more uh electric like SUVs and we got an announcement that I think is gonna actually be at CES of a car called Rivian. Yeah, Rivian. It's a car maker. They were at the New York Auto Show and did very well. They have a car called the R1T. It's a truck, $70,000 before the tax credit. And uh, it has a 105 kilowatt hour battery. So that's bigger than the Whoa. 75 yeah. that's in the, the Tesla. So they the, got a big round of investment to the tune of another $1.3 billion from investors. I think the picture of the car looks... Like an SUV. Like, that's what's yeah, different. That looks like a Jeep. Yeah. Or Range Rover or something. Yeah, yeah, it yeah fine. totally. Uh, what is it going to take for a, a startup, electric car startup in the U.S. to overtake Tesla? Because I think overseas, Tesla is not up front. There is definitely a prestige, like a global prestige to the brand Tesla and the way that Apple has. But even Apple struggles uh, internationally and in China because there are so many homegrown alternatives. And over there, the regulations may be different and spinning up an automobile, an electric vehicle company may be different and people may be a little more cost sensitive. And Tesla, I think, has a tougher hill to climb in, uh, climb in a, uh, in a wow. country like China. But in the States... I think the Bolt has proven that it's not cost alone. You know, because the Bolt is cheaper than the Model right. Three, and, and it's not a six, it's and it has the same, essentially the same uh, range as the base model, mm -hmm. and it has proven to be less successful. Yep. So I think that it's it's a number of things. Like Tesla did the right thing, starting out with the Roadster because they had this sort of sex appeal from the beginning yep. that all the other cars inherited aesthetically, and they had that image for the for the company. And then they keep, they do this constant firmware update stuff. So they're always in the news. But you presumably, any startup that's going to get a billion dollars in investment, they can do the exact same things, right? There's no I think their pathway competitive, is different. competitive advantage there. Like they're going to do auto updates. They have big batteries. They can have similar range, similar acceleration, handling. I think if you're starting now, if you're a startup and you're so far behind um, some things that don't scale easily, like manufacturing processes and like, supply chain and all of those things that take time to build up. I think the entry point is all of the delivery vehicles that are out there. Like if you're making an SUV, is it that big of a leap to go to like the van? So on a B2B, not to consumer. Yeah. If you're if you start replacing UPS and FedEx and Amazon Prime trucks with electric trucks and you generate that kind of like positive cash flow from those services you're either going to be acquired, which is probably what the target of this company's whole model mm -hmm. is, or you're going to generate enough money that you're going to be able to break into the consumer market with something that is much more polished because of how you've perfected it in a business setting. That sounds like the virtual reality industry right now with you know Oculus subsidizing so much of their products. The other guys are focusing on B2B. Because that's what people expect to pay more. You can have fewer consumers, but we'll charge them more, work closer with them. And you build your experience developing a product and releasing a product so that you're not putting all your eggs in one consumer bucket. I mean, Tesla's doing the same thing, though. I mean, the truck well, is yeah, the, the, the big, you know, fleet carrying truck is probably going to be... What are you talking about? The, not the cyber truck. No, you're talking the, about the semi. The semi truck yeah. is probably going to be their, their sort of killer vehicle. Uh, if it's able, if it's affordable and able to sort of take off and demonstrate uh, success, because it'll just flatten the market. But let's talk about just in the consumer space. For a generation of car owners coming up in the next, let's say, 10 years who are looking to buy an electric car, because I think it makes total sense in the next, this decade, in the 20s, the year of the electric, the decade of the electric car mm -hmm. adoption. You know, it's it's no longer people are f uh, afraid for range necessarily. Um or that a company's going to go out of business, like what is going to get them to adopt something that's not necessarily from an existing car company, from a Ford and a Chevy and a Toyota, or from a Tesla to, to buy into a, a Rivian or, or something else? Is it range? Is it some battery technology? Is it going to be like, you know, if, if a car came out and said, for the same price, we have 500 miles in range, which is, would be, require a huge 
innovation and breakthrough in battery technology or efficiency, but that would be incredibly compelling. I, I think with SUVs, you're already in a luxury kind of marketplace. So let's say you're competing with a $50,000 SUV. I know mm -hmm. SU, some SUVs are a lot cheaper than that. If you come in at $60,000 and you have a sexy as, as hell SUV uh, that's all electric, I think you can do really well in that market. Now, the question is, like, if the economy turns down, are you going to still do well when luxury sales decline? I think that's the place you break in. What we what we really need, like all of us, is this huge government stimulus uh, to uh, plant a bunch of fast chargers everywhere yeah. that, that anybody can use. Uh, solar powered, maybe. Uh, that's, a, that's the true competitive advantage that Tesla has right now right, is exactly. the, the network. Yeah. Uh, I mean, there's one free fast charger in all of San Francisco. And uh, as far as I know, on the peninsula, like it's just... But it doesn't need to be free necessarily. Not necessarily, but like the malls that have the free charging are that, those are like oasises for, for electric vehicles. It's a, it, <laughs> I had a horrible experience this past weekend where there were two open, oh, no. two of them, a normal and the fast. Okay. I gave up the normal, went around to the fast, other bolt swooped in. Oh, no. Got it. I said, oh, I'll go back. Oh no. By the time I got there, a leaf in the spot. Take, took it. It was horrible. It was horrible. I mean, it's it's like uh, the fast track lanes. It's like eventually that will be the new new normal, and there'll be EV only. Imagine the first mall developer. Yeah. That has a that puts a parking lot in which it's all EV only, or most EV only, over fifty percent EV only, and tradition in the best spots. This is all gonna go away in a few years. In I mean, way. like the idea of like free charging at all. Like uh, you're basically getting. Free electricity. Who does that? Yeah, I don't think we're going to. They're going to transition. Not, I don't think it's about pay. free charging. It's all going to be pay. So that's why Charge Point does really well. But it's all about availability. But it, most of the Charge Point is just two forty, and they, they need to have a lot more fast chargers yeah. in order for it to be practical for everyone else. You, you take that for granted with the superchargers. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and and superchargers have not are not without their own problems. There was a video that was going around over Christmas break on one hundred and one at the Madonna Madonna Inn uh, by Slow by San Luis Obispo, and the line for that supercharger was over an hour and a half long. A line? Yeah. Yeesh. The superchargers setup is is such that, you know, when the it's impacted, the, the network of cars knows that it's impacted and they automatically shift your max charge to like 60%, something well under hmm. uh, 80%. Um, unless you you can over always override it if you you know you need to go further, but then their the idle fees start picking up. I mean, there's a there's a supercharger at eh, it's not it's not a supercharger it's a destination charger so it's slightly different. That's a two forty. Yeah, that's a two forty. But there's one at like for example at Lucasfilm, uh, and if you park there and you watch a, you know go to an event and you could they charge you idle fees of a dollar a minute Whoa. if you Jeez. don't attend to your car and unplug your car, and that's that's their only solution right now to get people in and out quickly. But you see these you see videos of like lines of cars. Waiting, Tesla's yeah. waiting for their turn to get 15 minutes of juice on the supercharger, uh, just so they can get back on the freeway. And so, even you know, as successful as their charger network is, and it's a huge, big part of why they are successful, there's still a lot of room to grow. There's none in the city limits of San Francisco. Yeah, I know. You have to get out. You have to get the Daily City for the closest one. Yeah. Uh, okay, we're gonna move on from cars. Uh, Oh, ooh, New Year's. One thing I did want to talk about, there was a video that's going on around the internet, and it's pretty pretty incredible video. It's uh, of Shanghai, New Year's Eve, and instead of fireworks, it looks like they're using a fleet of what looks like hundreds, if not a thousand I think drones. it was 2,000. 2,000 drones that have lights on them that are then coordinated to then create these spatial uh, models, these images of spheres of the word 2020, uh, even of an animating figure. It looks like a, a man that's running. That, the video was unbelievable. Uh, there are certain places in the world, I think, I want to say Australia in certain places, where they, uh, fireworks are now, uh, and there's a countdown timer, of course, the drones lit up and changed. And change their time, but um, but some places in the world where fireworks are uh, not permitted for at the scale 
that some people have expected for New Year's Eve because of fire considerations. Uh, and so drones seem to be a, um, a solution for that. I am a, I want to believe this is real. So far, there's only this one video of this that's been shared around. This is the kind of thing that would be on the going viral with people's cell phones. Yes, but also, and, and that could also be the fact that we are more isolated than we think. Like there is a internet in China that we don't have regular access to or easy access to and social networks as big as Twitter, as, you know, as, as on the scale of, of Facebook mm -hmm. that we have no insight into. Okay. And, and videos of this may be everywhere. I mean, Shanghai is one of the big, biggest cities in the world. It's an interesting perspective change because I would have said that they have, they don't have access to our internet. Same thing. Yeah. Exactly. I, I, the, the reverse is, is true. I'm sure if crazy things happen in the United States, you know, we see it all over Twitter and YouTube, but a lot of that stuff is blocked in China. And people may not have access to that. It's not like there are some people. There's a, a network of underground people ripping videos and, and re-uploading them to their networks. So it could very well be that there are a ton of these videos of this Shanghai drone show New Year's Eve, just not on the internet we're familiar with. I would love to know if someone out there has seen more than one video of this. It's certainly believable. It it totally is believable. to an extent, but I don't know how long these drones are running. Yeah, and, and also the but scale of how far they are. Are from each other. If but a fireworks show is only 10, 15 minutes, which is believable in a drone yeah, se setting. I would believe five, five to ten minutes for yeah. sure. E extraordinary cost, though. Like that. That's the one thing about this this kind of scale is that it's beyond a fireworks show. Well, fireworks it's, shows can cost millions of dollars. Uh, yeah, I, I guess that's, that's like true. Three million dollars for a uh, for a New Year's Year fireworks show but, uh, in a big city. I imagine this costs more. I imagine that two, well, two thousand drones with yeah with that kind of technology and all of the high power RGB LEDs and networking involved. But they can reuse it for Chinese New Year's. This I think is a rehearsal for Chinese New Year if it's real. Sure. So the one thing I haven't heard is what company. Was this? Oh, I'm, I'm sure it's some Chinese company. I, See, know, but I, the, we haven't even heard which Chinese company. I, I, at again, least the reports I've seen so this far. This is American ignorance of like, we just don't know what's going on over there. No, but even like the New York Times when they reported on this, like yeah. didn't have the name of a company, yeah, right? So true. like, this isn't like, you know, some small outfit. So uh, because IBM didn't say they did this with their, mm -hmm. with their drone light show that they've had. I want to do this on a small scale. I want to do this with micro drones in the tested office. Well, that scale is the other question, right? Like fireworks scale, when fireworks explode and you see those giant spheres, they are big in yeah. the sky. And some of this video looked like it was being filmed with drones, mm -hmm. right? Because it was from an aerial perspective, yeah. which of course would make sense. So was is the scale of this when you saw the running man yeah. right which was made of hundreds of drones of this mm -hmm. animated figure who is going through this running motion was that a you know a, a, a 50 foot tall display uh -huh. or is that a 500 foot tall display right and it, how volumetric is it exactly the or, density or yeah. and, and does it need to be that, that dense because well, you have this light bleed it would need to be that dense if you care about how many angles you see it from because, you know, if you see it from the side and it's two-dimensional, it looks perfect. Right. Because from the front, it's, it looks like a line. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Or certain angles, it just may not look right at all because of the overlapping yeah, drones. But, but if it were volumetric, if it were truly 3D, it would look great. For I mean, some of the stuff did look I truly know. volumetric. Yeah. Not the countdown. But no, the like, countdown was like a, a, on a plane. Yeah. But the running man, I keep going back to that. Were the drones actually moving or were there drones in place that were passing off, turning on and off the lights? Oh, they were moving. They were actually definitely. moving. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it was really cool. And th at the end of it, you even see a couple drones fall out of place. Oh, which okay. Which is either, if it's fake, like that's a nice touch. I got to hand it to them. But I think it's real. I want to believe it's real. I would love to see more videos of it. Yeah. And if that's a success, I mean, we're gonna, we know Disney's been working on this stuff. It, it means that they can program entirely new performances in shows. You could kind of... You know, batch this up, get 2,000 drones in the air every 15 minutes. Where, and Disney, no one in their right mind would do it over top of people. So the Disney, Disney has the patent to do it not over people, over, but there's plenty of space. Over their Disneyland. water? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Instead of the world of color mm -hmm. or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that'd be cool. It's, it's something that's going to become a new normal. And we saw uh, uh, you know, some tests of it, not, at, not only at CES, but like in places like the Super Bowl, they had it. The reason... I also I thought the Super Bowl was 
confirmed to be faked. Oh, maybe that was it. It was pre-recorded. Pre-recorded. It okay. wasn't but there fake. was drone. Okay. The, Thank what you. was fake was over 10 years ago now. Do you remember in the China 2008 Olympics, the one that Ang Lee directed, what was broadcast was augmented reality. There was some stuff that, that was Wait, there wasn't 2,000 people drumming on those drums? Well, no, the drumming was real. Yeah. Carmen's dreams were real, but like the uh, the some of the, um, the 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 footsteps over the city, that yeah. stuff was augmented, right? Yeah. So all we're seeing is video. It could be enhanced, could be manipulated, but I want to believe it's real. I want to believe. I know. All right, uh, we're gonna wrap up technology by talking about some CES. It's right around the corner. We're not going, unfortunately, this year. I've never been. You've never been? No. Do okay. I want to go? Eh, not really. I don't feel like I don't want to go. I heard this. No, you, you might find some interesting stuff there. It just if you just go as an attendee and not have to actually run around yeah. for meetings. I heard that Samsung might reveal a bezel-less television. Did you see these? Does that excite you? Like, what, uh, if you're no. watching TV in the dark, what's the, what difference? Is yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, I like the move towards a thinner bezel, but I don't need yeah. to be zero. They're right. Pretty thin already, and they're yeah. thin. Uh, the TVs themselves are already pretty thin, also. So uh, it it once again is another. It's a gimmicky thing. I don't know what the, the TV thing this year is going to be. Yeah. Rollable TV. Rollable t- uh, we, saw, we saw some of it last year. So LG has indicated they have um, uh, transformed it so it's not just a roll up from a unit, but actually something that can roll down <laughs> oh, whoa, from the ceiling. Oh, whoa, 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 the upside down. Apparently that it was non-trivial. Uh, but uh, they've also said they're going to unveil a... A flexible display for air, uh, for air um, airplanes. What for yeah. back of the seats? So both for back of the seats, but also side of the cabin can turn into like TV display. Oh, neat! Wow. Yeah, I I was looking into. Uh, we're talking about maybe doing a, a cruise this summer with the family. Mm-hmm. Finally, going to Europe. Wow. And uh, some some cruise lines put. The, they have the internal rooms that don't have any, you know, balcony or window to the outside world. Some of these cruises actually have fake portholes on those internal rooms. Oh no! With displays behind. That's them. the most one of the most dystopian things <laughs> yeah, ever. It is, it is. What if oh it's a what God. if it's a camera feed though? Right. I think some of these are. But yeah. That that's still super dystopian. Yeah. Like I'm in the uh, cruise themselves are also controversial. I, I, I'm. I'm mostly pro cruise. I, I enjoy the experience, but I understand in, all the complaints that people have about cruises. In terms of like the the fuel, the fuel, yeah. the the economics of it. They they basically like the, the the legionnaires. Yeah, all that stuff. Yeah, norovirus. <laughs> and, you know, the horror stories that people have had on cruises. The, you know, the, all the uh, overworked workers. Yeah, they, yeah. Oh, 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 yeah. Nonstop. Anyone that watched Succession this year understands the potential downfalls of cruises, but it's artifice. Right, yeah. and this is one of the peak ways you're you're selling a. You can now sell a closet. You know how there are regulations in most cities that if you call something a bedroom, it needs to have a window to the outside world. Yeah, that's not the case for cruises. You can literally put in a closet, and I mm-hmm. guess a closet with at least an LED light that looks like it's the water, the Finding Nemo ride at Disneyland, the submarine ride, and that's that's your. Uh, There's a lot of people at CES excited about this technology. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. I'm sure. Uh, Okay, uh, other things at CES, uh, LG and Samsung apparently both now have AI fridges they're planning on unveiling. What does that mean? Does it like understand what's in the fridge? Yes, they will recognize food with cameras. So then will it tell me like, you have this stuff, you can make this meal oh, with that's the int- stuff that's you have? Cool. <laughs> well, the question oh is God. how organized is that to be? Like, you have to put the fruit in the fruit drawer mm-hmm. and then it scans you know, the fruit that way. Everyone stores their fruit differently. And but as long as it's like re- like reasonable, like we can see understand how much milk you have left, and so you have to buy the standard gallon to put it in the gallon slot, and then it'll do the measurement. It must does it weigh the shelves? Oh, so you take good it question. out, you yeah. put it back. Yeah, that, it knows that how would, much that you, could be a way how to much do you it. used. Yeah, sure. Yeah, uh, I I don't think we need cameras inside our fridges telling us what what foods in our fridges. Mm-hmm. One thing I would be interested in if we're talking about the, the the benefits of like using AI for for food health is uh, food going bad. See, I'm with you there because I think food waste is a huge 
it, it's a huge driver of climate change. It's a huge driver of just waste in general. And so if it's able to actually tell when stuff is going to go bad and alert you, that so how, could be how would that how would too. that work? Would that be some type of uh, I'm toxicology sh- reporting, like it needs sampling. Ta- it needs to taste the food. It needs yeah. a sample, right? Yeah. Like, what you what if it have a, a little? What if it just has like a generalized? Here's how long this stuff is good for, mm-hmm. and it recognizes it when you put it in. So it has a date mm. of when you put it in, and it's like, okay, you have two weeks. So for the lettuce bag, or the whatever. way to, to bootstrap that would be the fridge would have to come with its own set of Tupperware. And you use the fridge approved Tupperware in which it can recognize, you know, each Tupperware has hidden fiducials on it. And it knows when you put something in and when you took something out and it maybe combines it with a weighing system. And then it then intelligently knows, okay, they stored this food, this, these leftovers in this Tupperware and it's been five days and it hasn't moved. It's not going to do that. The problem with all of this stuff is like, I'm sure an AI fridge is going to cost like five grand as opposed to like, you know, a thousand dollars for a normal fridge. Not to mention the hundred dollar monthly subscription fee. Yeah, of course. Well, they also want to tie you into a fee to, to deliver you the food that to replace the food exactly. that's going yeah. bad. That actually sounds okay to me, like a food delivery service paired with my smart fridge. But I mean, and I'm sure Amazon is one click away from from making that happen. Uh, other thing we expect at CES is, of course, computers technology. Uh, we're going to see some of the first laptops. Uh, well. Intel 10th gen processors are coming out, and Dell has a new one. The Dell 13, uh, XPS 13 2020 has, uh, has uh, Intel 10th gen processors in there. Um, I think this is, gosh, I don't know where we are now in the, um, the Moore's Law of tick. It, they're no longer in process and uh, optimization. They're like in process optimization up in three years of optimization and then a new process. But the 10th gen ones are the first in a, in a new process um, that they've got stable. So uh, this this could be a great year for laptops, is what I'm saying. For low power and long battery life laptops. I'm saying we are over time and we should wrap it up. Okay, okay, okay. Let's continue. Um, anything else in tech we want to go over? No. <laughs> we're it. That's it. Hopefully more next week. Oh, wait. We got a, a special. Shoot. I should have been prepared. How do we do that? We switch over here, right? Yeah. Yeah. And then we hit that. I'm a pinball nerd. Pin, 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 pin. Just to my point. Finally. Pinball. That makes me very happy. Stranger Things, people. Stranger Things pinball. Are you interested? Should I be? I mean, I I am interested thematically, but I'm, should I be from the the, the okay. play field? I mean, I I can I have not played it. I can't tell you. It was announced uh, the week of Christmas by Stern Pinball. Stern, okay, they make good stuff. They they they're the biggest pinball manufacturer going. Um, and this is designed by um, somebody who came out of retirement for the first time since the late '90s to design his first pinball machine since Medieval Madness, Brian Eddy. Uh, has was recruited by Stern to finally make another pinball machine over 20 years later. Wow, still uh, got it, hopefully? Well, he's the he used to be like the guy. Like if you if, besides Pat Lawler and Steve Ritchie, like if you wanted to hire somebody who made hit machines, you wanted Brian Eddy cuz he made The Shadow, he made which was okay, really novel, but not like a huge successful like commercial hit. Right. But then he made Attack from Mars, which was huge, and then he made Medieval Madness, which was for the longest time like the most coveted pinball machine. Um, it was one of the few pinball machines that actually went up in value after it was you know purchased. So uh, he's brought out of, out of retirement. Uh, this very similar layout and similar flow to the last two Attack from Mars and Medieval Madness for obvious reasons, um, but based on Stranger Things. And so Medieval he, Madness was one very popular because there was a whole kind of the back of the play field was a castle that you were attacking. Very nice, Norman. And that the like the, the way you approach it, you know, there's a whole sequence of events to unlock the gate, and actually, like you had a very yeah. easy to understand uh, mission yes. to go through. And Attack from Mars and uh, Medieval Madness both games with a sense of humor, which mm-hmm. is not 
common in pinball okay. for you know whatever reason. Is is that look like this is the case here? The back of the play field, what's going on? Like, is this like are you trying to get into the upside down or what's what's going the on? The upside down isn't the game. It happens randomly. So for whatever reason, you're playing the game. Suddenly, it enters the upside down, and there are hurry up shots that you're supposed to hit. Okay. There's a demogorgon behind this center screen. If you hit the screen enough, it folds down, becomes a ramp. It is a screen. Oh, should, cool. Well, no. In the pro, it's just an image, but in the I'll tell you in a second. So it comes down. You, the Demogorgon's behind. You I see. You shoot the yeah, ball yeah, in there. Yeah. That's shoot sort of it's like the castle or the or the Martian. You know the, the spaceship. Um, and from what we can tell, similar flow. Interesting. It's got crazy deep rules. You're gonna be playing if you buy this machine for home. It's just got mode after mode after mode. You you can go way deep on it. Um, it the sounds seem okay. They do have uh, custom speech by uh, the cop. What's his name? David Harbour, that yeah, guy. David Harbour, yeah, that guy. He did custom, you know, extra ball, you know, that kind of thing. <laughs> uh, <laughs> okay, <laughs> um, but the most compelling thing about this to me is not the pro, but the premium in the LE, which we don't the have most in, expensive in versions. Yeah, those are the more expensive versions, and I don't even know if it's like it, it's should I say compelling or should I say intriguing because I haven't seen it yet. And what they've done is they've mounted a projector underneath the apron, which is w- where the flippers are, and it, the projector faces up into the game. Wait, wait. Underneath the flipper, so the f- very front of... That's the apron, where it says Stern and yeah, 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 things yeah, yeah. And, and the rules. Okay, yeah. They've put a projector, a Pico projector down there, and then they put reflective material everywhere they can, including that screen. Wait, so it doesn't just project on the screen that in front of the Demogorgon. Right. It also has projection mapping, you're saying? Essentially. On the other parts of the playfield. Precisely. So where you see those twos there next to the ramps? Yes. Those are... Re- reflective, so they can actually project moving images on those. The uh, side where it says stern, ab- yeah, 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 above the ramp. any surface that's facing the projector is basically now active and can Whoa. be and can be dynamic. So best played in the dark. Absolutely, like I think this is one of those games that might that would suffer from well lit yeah. <laughs> rooms, which is. Kind of a weird balance to strike, especially on location. I mean, pinball is best played in the dark anyway. But the pros are typically for location play, and the people playing at home are buying the premiums and the LEs. So that's going to be where you're going to see the, that projector. And I, I can't wait to see that in real life. I've seen a video of it, and it's kind of like, I see the potential, but things don't shoot. No, nothing, that kind of thing does not translate to video. So I want to see it in real life and get a feel for it. Also, the, as your ball's moving yeah. along... The play field, you would be obstructing yeah, yeah, the projector. Yeah. yeah, maybe you need a white ball so that, so that it, <laughs> it, it reflects. Like it looks, maybe not. Is it the retroreflective material? I hope so. Like, so you get maximum brightness. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I aimed hope so. right at your eyes. Well, that thing is, it would reflect back at the projector. Yeah, so it doesn't. Hmm. I hope that it is like movie screen material though that really that reflects well and amplifies the light as opposed to just white tape what what's the price for uh, a premium or an le uh typical stuff uh, i think they retail for mid six thousands for the premium and seven thousands for the yeah, le maybe With eight. pro being like five thousand yeah five something uh, it's all it, it, street prices are always lower than the retail but yeah um curious about it neat game love stranger things so i'll be it'll be fun to play it's it's the uh, out like you can find it on location. Oh, really? Already out? Yeah, I don't oh, think there's one wow. in the city yet, but it's uh, it was one of those where they announced and they had it ready. Is that usually the case now for Stern? Where they? No, usually there's a, there's a few weeks of a wait, maybe a month. Maybe. I mean, that's still pretty pretty fast development. The fact that they they can, in a year they're doing like two two machines a year. They try to do four four machines yeah. a year. Yeah, that's a lot of pinball. Yeah, people are eating it up. Big resurgence. Uh, and also, if you have a VR headset, um, you can play a lot of the classics in VR now. People have converted uh, the games to full cabinets and put rooms around them, so it's a better VR experience. Uh, if you check out uh, VR, VPX, uh, pinball g- rooms, it's uh, all visual pinball. It's kind of hacky to get it going, but somebody's been converting those throughout December and is promising to do one a week for the next year. Uh, it's, a, it's a really cool development if you have a VR headset and you want to play some pinball. Uh, Google that, Visual Pinball VR VPX. Sweet. Oh, we got to switch back now. Oh, no. This is horrible. And science. Now it's time for a moment of science. 
All right. So there are these devastating wildfires that are happening in Australia. The Right now, as we're recording this, uh, the fires are the size of the country of Belgium, um, oh as the is the best way I've seen it reported. The length of the fire front goes from New York to L.A., back to uh, New York, and then halfway back across the country again. It's that long of a of a firefight. It dwarfs what we saw in California in the past couple of years. Um, these are massive fires. And the science behind fire management has been going through an evolution. A lot of the, the work that um, uh, basically models how fires spread uh, was done by uh, uh, this scientist Richard Rothermill uh, in the late 70s, where he developed a, a, in a model that would, took into account the active fuel available, the ignition point of those fuels. So like different plants and trees have different ignition points where they catch on fire, uh, the prevailing wind, uh, and the slope of the ground. And a couple other factors, you're able to get the speed at which a fire can sort of move through an area. But what it didn't take into account was essentially the the unit it basically assumes some sort of linear kind of uniformity of the area like fire moving through almost a field even with different ignition points and what we see is that the wind patterns inside of fires are really complicated because of the upwelling of air that's happening in a dynamic way the picture on the screen kind of shows a a wildfire in motion what actually happens is you don't have a uniform height of fire sort of moving through an area, you get these peaks and valleys. And it, and those peaks and valleys aren't due to the vegetation itself. They're actually due to some of the wind patterns that are generated. And in these valleys, uh, basically wind keeps whipping through uh, and that pushes the ignition forward to catch something else on fire. These obviously, uh, and this is a simplification based off of um, the the topography uh, but there's a new model that Los Alamos National Laboratory uh, came out with uh, that took this into account in order to better evaluate where firefighters can set prescribed burns uh, as a prediction of where the fire is actually going. Uh, and they came up with a simulation, which I'll play okay. here in one second for you. Um, and so this is, I found this like really fascinating from the perspective of what's potentially possible by using a model like this. So the prescribed burn is the area that's sort of being lit on the screen there um, that uh, takes into account where they think the fire is going to go. So they burn this ahead of time, hoping to stop the fire in its Because tracks. you're basically taking away the yeah, available the fuel, fuel yeah. uh, from the fire. And by doing so, uh, you can potentially slow it down. Uh, but in order to do that effectively, we have to have better simulations of understanding where and how quickly the fire is going to spread. Um, so I think you're going to see a lot more science in this kind of area with the emergence of of these wildfires across the world. Uh, it's a, a completely tragic event, what's happening in Australia, what's going to continue to happen. Uh, but it's good to see science progressing uh, along this front. Uh Second story, Google released a blog post with an accompanying um, uh, paper in Nature where they used DeepMind to, um, uh, to evaluate mammograms. And what they were looking for is they took a sample set of about 50,000 mammograms in the UK, uh, and they used DeepMind's algorithm to detect potential cancerous masses or detect whether there wasn't something there that the doctor had initially uh, indicated was a potential um, uh, area of breast cancer. To detect a false positive. False positive and looking for false negatives. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and in doing so, they report that their deep mind was able to better predict false negatives at a, rate, a higher rate of about 8% and false positives at a rate of about 3% over about 50,000 mammograms, which is that's pretty significant. Yeah. Uh, and what's interesting about the technology is the ascribe the reason why is that in a lot of situations that um, the people reading these mammograms not aren't necessarily trained in breast imaging, depending on where you get it, why, it, like who's on um, that night. So there could be a user error situation here. Also, the the kind of information that's coming out of these X rays. 
is not always easily um, uh, uh, discerned by the human eye compared to uh, an algorithmic de detector. So the areas highlighted yellow in the screen are actual areas that the uh, that DeepMind picked up on that were cancerous areas that, that humans that not. the human missed. Interesting. Um, so I think it's uh, it's an interesting application of imaging technology into uh, a health space, and I think you're going to see more and more of this from these AIs that we're talking about playing StarCraft. This is actually what they're going to be purposed towards. They can already do this at this early stage. Like that's what's amazing is how good this is going to get. Yeah, I don't want to overstate this. This is just like this is more of a Google blog post than it is like a mm -hmm. a really replicated scientific study. Hey, but I, the initial I, results are are pretty positive. If I did this, I'd post a blog post. <laughs> Fair <laughs> enough. I get a weird uh, video to conclude. Um, so a set of researchers in uh, British Columbia. Uh, made two different uh, AIs and made them play some common games against each other. Uh, in this video, these two AIs are playing soccer. It, it kind of looks like a totally, totally useless battle simulator. Oh, yeah, if you're play, it. play it, play it. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and so what it did is it gave them the rules. And the, uh, and the blue uh, AI here, um, it was pretty adept at scoring. And the red one was trying to come up with techniques to stop them from scoring a goal. So the red one comes up with this technique. Oh my god! Where it just falls down, uh -huh. and because the Flopping. red the red AI is basically the goalie, it flops <laughs> down. The blue AI doesn't know what to do, and it gets confused. And it started it stopped scoring goals at the same rate that it was scoring before. So the AI basically invented a way to confuse the other AI. And um, it, we've seen this in sports a couple times. So it had nothing to do with the ball. It was psychological. It was all psychological <laughs> warfare between the two AIs. And they do this in a couple other simple games. We've seen this in sports happen a couple times. There's this famous clip in basketball. I think it was a high school game where a guy was shooting a free throw and um, makes it. And they have to go the length of the floor to score two points to win. And one of the players runs to the edge of the court and just starts barking like a dog. And all the players from the opponent's team just look at him, and his teammates run down and score. Wow. <laughs> uh, and it's the same idea. It's psychological warfare. Yeah. And so it probably has limited use. Like, the blue AI will eventually learn that this won't work, but I think it's hilarious. I love it. It's like those running animations or the, the bot trying to figure out yeah, how to, tra how to run. traverse those crazy environments. Just like a baby. <laughs> oh, are we done? Yeah. Well, I think we're oh, done. That was a good one. The VR Minute, virtual reality this week. All right. A lot of people got quests, Oculus Quests over the holidays for, for Christmas, no, at least no. anecdotally. A lot of people didn't. Lot, well, they are back ordered until some people actually it, it, I got earlier shipping notifications, January, yeah. but for Oc a lot of people, end of January, February. That's right. If you try to order from Oculus, it's February. And Amazon, I think, is currently saying like January 20th, something yes. like that. Yeah. Uh, but that's good news for developers and uh, good news for just the VR community in general. There's sure. a lot of cool stuff. I mean, we, we didn't do a kind of like any of your recommendations for things for people to try, but the marketplace is packed. And one of my biggest recommendations is uh, came from you, Jeremy. Put on side quest and load up some of the stuff that's there. Yeah, the the free stuff. The free stuff. Yeah. So what what did you try? The the, the VR crisis. Oh, the, did you try that finally? I, I love it. Crisis VR gate. Crisis VR gate. Yeah. I'm no good at it. Yeah. But that's why I love ah, it. Ah, that's the thing. It's hard. It's really hard. Yeah. So it's basically the time crisis. Yeah. Where there there's no uh, locomotion. Well, there there isn't uh, locomotion that you control. Uh, you stay in one spot until you've taken out all the bad guys. You're you're a police officer. There's a bank heist. You're taken over. But it's unforgiving. No auto aim. You are right. very, You peek your head out and you are shot. You can get hit a, a three times, seven, sure. a few times, yeah, but yeah. you don't want to get shot. Yeah. Because so of it, bad news. It's lots of leg day. Lots of crouching. Lots of very. It's it, it's the right type of hardcore. Even though it's yeah. very like Minecraft like blocky graphics. I love how hard it is. Yeah. Uh, otherwise, it wouldn't be fun. Mm -hmm. uh, also, uh, Quake Two. Mm -hmm. In VR, yeah, loving that. Yeah, that works. It plays like a native game. Feels native. It, it feels like uh, more fun than the original. Like I loved Quake One. Uh, I played Quake Two, but I don't have the nostalgia for it. Uh, mm. But Quake Two now, it feels like it just feels like it's better a better experience. Like I'm I'm exploring the world. I'm having a good time. I'm all the weapons are sixed off. 
uh, all the models have been upgraded to higher res models, just higher res textures than in the original game. Very well done translation. And you also mentioned the Half-Life conversion, which yes. actually predated the Quake 2 conversion. Yeah. Um, and I tried that, and I, every, a lot of people say that's their favorite VR experience. For me, the controls are a little more finicky, and so I often forget how to do things because there's a few more things you have to know how to do sure. than Quake 2, which yeah. is basically like aim and shoot. Um, how, how are you finding Half-Life? I have not done Half-Life yet. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to do it on the index. I want the best quality, visual quality, and a lot of the, the control mapping. Well, I think it's only on uh, Quest. Is it only in Quest? Yeah. Really? I, okay. think, I think Quake 2 and, and Half-Life have only been converted for mm. six off in Quake. I could be completely mistaken, but I, I'm fairly certain at least with Quake 2 that's the case. Mm. Uh, it's, what's amazing is that these games that, from a game design standpoint, are, may seem dated. These are games that were released decades ago. They still are compelling in VR. Yep. Because that's the, we are, if uh, we've, I've said this multiple times, it feels like the early days of, of PC gaming. Right. And then, not to mention the value that you get. You, yeah. they, you buy the games on Steam for a couple dollars and you yeah. can play them for 20 hours. It, that the Enemy encounters that are that on a, with a gamepad or a keyboard mouse would be boring or intense. Yeah. In, in VR. I, I don't know what Oculus is thinking not hiring this guy, the, Dr. B, for whoever's mm. doing these conversions. Be, for, get him on the team, get the rights to these old games, sell them on the store, clean up the UI, make, just r make it a little more refined. Yeah. They'd sell a, a bundle of these things. I'm really curious what new owners of Quest are uh, latching onto. What, what are the things that they really like? Super Hot announced that they grossed $2 million uh, in, on in a all, week. In a week on all platforms. Uh, from new users they, after Christmas. They wouldn't say which platforms were the best selling. I think they're under NDA for that kind of thing. I presume it's going to be Quest and PSVR. Yeah. That's that's my guess. Uh, but that's that's a good amount. It's it's good momentum, of course, for comparison to core PC games and uh, you know Steam games in general, they're they're not um it's it's not those numbers, but Beat Saber did make the Steam list of top selling 100 games. Of the year. Did it. And it's the only VR game, VR exclusive game, sorry, to, to do so. Have you tried the 360 levels yet? I have not done that yet. How could you not? Ah, there's so, it, so much to do. I think it transforms the game. Uh, my son doesn't like them as much, mm -hmm. but I, I feel like it moved it from a game that I like to a game that I love. Oh. So good. I Very think good. they need... It was, so I put a lot of family members in VR for the first time, and we played a lot of Beat Saber over the break. I think they still need more music. Because yeah. there's only... There's three soundtracks... And I, I think that's the feedback I heard. It's mm -hmm. like, music is awesome. I want more of it. Yeah. Green Day stuff is pretty good and unique. Like, they, that's the first rock they've had. Like, yeah. it's always been electronic, at least largely electronic. Uh, Oculus managed to ship the link cable, their link cable, before the end of the year. Got mine in, and then I realized I still need to upgrade my PC, so I have a dedicated USB-C port on the front. So I yeah. can use it. I'm still using the Anker cable, the, the 10 foot one, not the 15 foot one. But the build quality is really good. It's more flexible than I expected it to be. It's thicker than I imagined. It is, but it's still very, very flexible. It's fiber optic. You don't want to flex that too much. Well, but, but I'm saying it, yep. it's, it's not like, it, <laughs> yeah. Flex it until you hear the crack, and then order <laughs> right. a new cable. Right. It's, like an, it's like one of those optical cable, optical yeah. audio cables. Yeah. But more heavily shielded. Uh, I, th th I think the length really does matter to some setups. Yeah. Like I have a friend who's was just a ten foot wouldn't do it. Yeah. So I think. Well, and also the the port, the angled port on one side. Yeah, that so helps. You, yeah, so it's not just like sticking out like yep. it's a big USB cable, and also the the clip, which you could force make your own. But having the clip bundled in, it is expensive. It's eighty bucks. Yeah, but not if you find if you can find a fifteen foot optical USB C cable for less than eighty bucks, you you will have done what no one on Reddit could do. Uh, and then I, I think people have even tried using it on the new MacBook Pros, new 16-inch uh, MacBook Pros. And I know the uh, link is still in beta, and Radeon cards are not best supported right now, but the 5500 uh, Radeon card M um, uh, apparently works in, uh, uh, with boot camp. Huh. You, you, can run, you can run boot camp on a MacBook Pro wow. and use the link cable and play, play desktop what? VR games. Play what? Exactly. We could play like Beat Saber. I mean, yeah. you can play Beat Saber on the Quest anyway. But you could play, uh, I think people said... I don't, not Asgard's Wrath, but like some high-end VR games, desktop exclusive VR wow. games. Okay. Yeah, and you can also probably uh, Blade and Sorcery. That's what the that, Twitch players are playing. They're playing. They're yep. all, Gorn and Blade and Sorcery. Yep. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's what that's what the kids are playing. Uh, There's something that popped up on on uh, Reddit. Um, someone says that they work at a VR, they work in VR in a large engineering company, 
and HP gave them a roadmap that said that they're going to get an HP HP Reverb will get a refresh in 2020, huh. which with four cameras, which is the interesting thing. Now, wait, this is the high definition uh, Windows mixed Windows reality. reality headset. Windows mixed reality is two cameras on every headset. Right. This is the first indication I've seen that Windows that Microsoft is maybe continuing WMR and there might be a whole second generation of WMR headsets. Like just a wider tracking volume, I guess. I mean, I'm, I'd be happy for them to continue in any capacity yeah. and not just let Windows Mixed Reality yeah. kind of be this bargain bin headset, which I'm fine for people, great for people who can find Odyssey Pluses for 200 bucks, 180 bucks. Uh, but, you know, Microsoft investing in that space is not a bad thing. Yeah. Well, the reverb was not 200 bucks. No, 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 no. But it had the high resolution screen. It had the highest res screen I think I've seen in terms of pixel density. Yeah, across the entire yeah. view, viewing area. Yeah. Well, like the Vario. Pi Pimax, well, you're right. Vario is a unique thing. But the Pimax had a wider field of view and also high def. But this was, this was a smaller field of view with tighter packed pixels that mm -hmm. really looks good. Yeah. Yeah, a lot of good games coming out this year. It's going to be a big year for VR. Is it? We say it every year. What are you looking forward to besides Medal of Honor? Half of Alex. Oh, yeah, there's that. <laughs> but what about besides those two? <laughs> yeah, that, I think that's pretty good. That I is, think, that's, that's, good. I that's, think good. that's pretty good. That is good. But uh, but now that... Now that Stormland and, and Asgard's Wrath are out, you're thinking... Yeah, I just wonder, like, what, what else... Are we, I guess there's Echo Arena on Quest, which will be... Uh, That'll be great for I'm that. I'm looking community. forward. For, I mean, developers are showing all sorts of cool stuff using the SDK for hand tracking on the Quest. And I'm looking for a whole gener first generation of hand track experience. We should say that there are some demos on SideQuest. If you want to actually tr give your you know hand tracking a spin, mm -hmm. uh, you can get some cute little tech demos on there. Uh, yeah. But I wonder, like, I'm more curious about seeing what people end up doing with that that feels good than I am excited to use them. Like, I, I really feel like... Well, you don't know what you want yet. I, that might be the case. That might be the case. But yeah. I, I, it'll be an interesting puzzle to solve. Uh, the hand tracking versus controllers. What, Devel what is it suited for? And developers are sharing also interesting insights into what they're able to access to in hand tracking because what's out right now yeah. is a little bit more limiting than what we saw at Oculus Connect in terms of yeah. the, the fail states. Uh, and... Uh, the confidence number, like whether that's a sliding scale or that's a, a binary can track, can't track thing is something I think developers are wrangling with right now. Um, so that does it for the first podcast of the decade. Nice. Yeah. Got in. We're still under technically in holiday, but we'll be back in office next week. We have a bunch of cool videos on the site, a new one day build. We have like a handful of those already in the can, including a big project that we can't wait to show you in uh, later January. Uh, but any any resolutions for the year? Any any big things you're looking forward to? I need to lose 20 pounds. Okay. So I'm going to shoot for that. All right. Kishore? I didn't make any resolutions because I've never kept one ever before. Well, it's not required to keep, keep it them. simple. Keep it simple. All right. I'll come I'll come with prepared with some resolutions next week. <laughs> <laughs> I want to okay. clean up my office. I highly recommend it. It really is a life changer. I, I, I've heard. Yeah. And I hear it every, I hear it on the reg. It's really good. <laughs> that, that needs to happen. <laughs> well, hope you, hopefully you all had a wonderful holiday. Uh, looking forward to the year. And we'll be back next week. Guess who's back? <sighs> Wohawk's back. Wohawk is back. Forks when you're eating too fast. Hi there. I didn't see you. <laughs>
TVs. Not at all. Good yes. riddance, 3D. I bid you adieu. Smart TVs, on the other hand, don't seem to be going TVs. anywhere. Okay, let's start the show. Hello, TV, TV windows. Tell us what we are. Two Android 3.0 demos that were really just video loops. <laughs> all the way down to forks, forks. to tell you when you're eating too fast. Forks. forks to tell you when you're eating too fast. Forks to tell you when you're eating too fast. No one is talking about 3D anymore. No one is talking about 3D anymore. No one is talking about 3D anymore. No one. No one. No one. No one. No one. Amazing. I played that last week actually. Over it was it was there on our. Uh, you played it. Our Skype episode. I I spliced it in. Oh really? Yeah. Oh fantastic. Has Will heard it? No. He needs to hear this one. No, he doesn't. Oh, you think it'll inflate his ego? No, I think it'll bring back. <laughs> Unfond memories of that time. I loved it. Thank you, Wohawk. <laughs> Thank you, Wohawk. Happy New Year. We'll see you next time.